Indeed. Hey there, everybody, and welcome to this focus activity 10 to 13. Uh, my name is Sarah, so a quick introduction about myself. Uh, I am from the UK. I'm from a small town uh, near the city of Nottingham. Nottingham is very famous for uh, lots of different things, um, mainly Robin Hood, uh, Sherwood Forest, uh, Nottingham Forest, the football team, um, and lots of other things as well. Um, so yeah, that's me. And today my delectable colleague, Terry, is with me. Uh, Terry, do you want to say a few words about yourself and tell us where you come from? So my name is Terry, as Sarah said. I am from the United States, from Seattle. If Seattle sounds familiar, it's probably because of Grey's Anatomy or grunge music, Kurt Cobain and Nirvana. Um, it's also on the waterfront. So lots of seafood, lots of, of bad weather though. It rains nine months out of the year. So I don't miss that at all. <laughs> Hi, Jenny. Nice to see you joining us today. You're from Padua. Um, or pa Now, we say in the UK, we call it Padua, but I believe in Italy it's called Padova, but we say Padua. I don't know what you say in the US. How do you call Padova in the US, Terry? Padua. Ah, we say, yeah, Padua. But, uh, Padua. Yeah, so welcome, Jenny. Uh, if anybody else is online, just pop in the chat where you're from and then we can uh, give you a shout out. We've got uh, Virginie from Lyon in France. Hey, Virginie, how are you today? Hope you're well. Well, from, from France, yeah. you've been excellent. Yeah. Cool, good. Uh, you were talking about Seattle, Terry. Uh, Grey's Anatomy, is that filmed in a, is it in a real hospital? Is it act, does the hospital actually exist or is it in a studio? There's, it's filmed in a studio. There's a hospital that it's based on, which is Swedish Hospital up in the University District. So oh, okay. it's, it's made to look very much like a real hospital, but from what I understand, it's not filmed, it's not filmed at the hospital. <laughs> okay, well, no, I just wanted, I was curious, but uh, yeah. anyway. Okay, well, uh, nice to see you guys joining us. Uh, and as I say, we're going to be looking at false friends today. So that's what we're doing for the next uh, 45 minutes, 50 minutes. Uh, so I'm going to uh, change slide over to the next slide. And I'm going to ask uh, Terry to just read what we're going to do today. All right, false friends. In this focus activity, false friends and common errors. Okay, perfect. And we've just had a join from Lavinia. Welcome to Lavinia from Milan. Hope you're well. Hope it's uh, getting better up there with the uh, the coronavirus. We see that the numbers seem to be getting better, so that's really positive. Um, so welcome, Lavinia. Uh, yes, yeah, so false friends. Uh, Terry, now you have been living in Italy for a while. Have you ever had a problem with false friends from an Italian perspective? <laughs> yes, I have. Um, hmm. I had been in Italy about eight months and I was talking with a really good friend and, and I spoke just enough Italian to be, to, to think I understood things. And so one day she was talking about her cognata, which I knew was sister-in-law, so point for me. And uh, she, was, she was really irritated. And she kept talking about, e cosa fastidioso, cosa fastidioso. And for me, because in English, fastidious is like precise, I could not understand why she was so upset that her sister-in-law was precise. <laughs> it was about six months later when I understood dare fastidio to annoy. And I was, oh, that's what she was talking about. Yeah, very good, yeah. <laughs> it does happen. It does. Hey there, Vincenzo. Nice to see you from Bologna. Welcome to this webinar. Okay, so we're going to crack on and have a look at some uh, false friends. Uh, in the meantime, in the chat, if you have had any problems with false friends yourselves, can you just put in the chat the problems that you've had? So maybe put the words that you confused, uh, maybe tell us a little bit how you confuse them. 
just put them in the chat so then we can share them and we can talk about them all together as well. So let's have a look at some of the false friends that we can see today. Uh, let's have a look at the first one. Uh, so Terry, can you read the first slide for me? Of course. Oops. When Pepsi entered the Chinese market a few years ago, the translation of their slogan, Pepsi brings you back to life, was a little more literal than they intended. In Chinese, the slogan translated to Pepsi brings your ancestors back from the grave. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's kind of, uh, yeah, a bit of a false friend faux pas, shall we say. Um, so tell me a little bit about um, the ancestors. Who are your ancestors and what is a grave? Terry, do you want to just uh, help us out with some definitions here? Ancestors, well, our ancestors, uh, they are our family members who came before us. So my grandparents, my grandparents' parents, these are all my ancestors. Cool. Thank you very much. And why would they be coming back from the grave? What's the difference between relatives so your your parents your grandparents or your you know your extended family and ancestors and why would that be linked to the grave well because your ancestors are all of those in your family who well who came before before many generations who are all dead and therefore the grave what's the grave it is where they are interned it's where they are so you can either be interned in an urn in your ashes or interned in a coffin underground under the dirt but either way your body is not alive mm. it's actually funny because you talk about being interned i would say that in the uk we talk about being buried Interned is kind of like a, a very formal kind of literal word, but in more colloquial speech, we talk about being buried in the UK. I don't know whether you use it in the same way. We do, but the reason I used interned rather is because interned can be buried as in the coffin, or it can be the urn in the wall if you are cremated. Ah, for cremated. Ah, okay. Hmm, okay. But therefore, would you, so you call the grave in the cemetery so if you're cremated do you have a grave i thought the grave had to be underground exactly if you are know. cremated you are interned in a wall or maybe on someone's uh, mantle if you oh, are not cremated okay. you are interned underground or if you're buried underground okay hmm. okay i didn't know that learn something new every day here mm -hmm. even the teachers so <laughs> i have a little too much experience with death i think Mm, well, don't talk about that at the moment. That's yeah. not a... Let's, let's move on. Okay. Yeah. Uh, have a look at the next slide. Can you read this one for me, Terry? <clears throat> Oops. General Motors was confused when their new car, the Chevy Nova, wasn't selling in South America. The company finally realized that Nova in Spanish translated to, it won't go. Sales radically improved after the car was renamed the Caribe. Mm, yeah, true story. Yeah, it's very true. It was called the Nova in uh, in the UK, and it was always known as uh, as the Nova because obviously oh. Nova in English doesn't have a problem. But uh, no, I know that it had, it, it had a different name in Spain, and it wasn't called the Caribe. I don't know what it was called in Spain. I don't know. Um, but yes, another another faux pas from the marketing department. I wonder if people lose their jobs if they make these kind of mistakes in marketing. I don't know, but you know, it definitely makes me think that marketing, international marketing departments really should do some homework about what kind of names <laughs> they choose. <laughs> Yeah, because it makes you think, oh, you could make some really big mistakes and it's just, it could be, yeah, it cost you a cost you a market in the end of the day. But, uh, okay, let's have a look at the next one and then we'll come back to uh, the people who are watching and see if they have any stories to tell. Can you read for me, Terry, the next one? Of course. Oops. Again, oops. 
Sometimes it's one word that changes everything. When Parker Penn marketed a ballpoint pen in Mexico, its ads were supposed to say, it won't leak in your pocket and embarrass you. However, the company thought the Spanish word embarazar meant embarrass. Instead, the ads in Spanish said, it won't leak in your pocket and make you pregnant. <laughs> well, fortunately. Now, I have an actual experience of this mistake myself. I used to live in Madrid and... Uh, uh, before I went to Madrid, I did a, a month's course in Alicante. And I remember that I went out and I was with friends and my Spanish wasn't brilliant. Um, and so I was learning to say things and you, you try and practice and you try and make words up if you think you know the words. And I remember that I said, oh, estoy muy embarazada, which means I'm really embarrassed or so I thought. <laughs> and I was saying it to, to these friends who were looking at me going, well, you don't look it and you, you, you look, you don't look like you're embarrassed. I said, oh no, I go red sometimes. And they thought I was saying that I was pregnant. And for maybe one week or two weeks, they thought I was pregnant and I was maybe drinking alcohol and they were, but you know, if you're, if you're, if you're, if you're, if you're, if you're well, if you're embarrassada, maybe you shouldn't drink alcohol. And I was saying, no, no, no. If I get embarrassed, I drink more alcohol. It's good, <laughs> you know, it's good for me. And it was, it was only about, must have been about three weeks later when suddenly I went, oh, and I went, oh, I'm not embarrassed. So, <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> so that's my, my false friend faux pas that I made in Spain. But just going back to some of the vocabulary here, um, the word leak. So it says here, the pen won't leak in your pocket. So what does leak mean and what what other things do, can you have that leak okay so terry perhaps you can give us a definition of leak and if you're listening can you write down some other things that can leak because it's not just a pen that can leak so can you think of some other things that can leak and terry what's your definition of leak my definition of leak wow Never had to define it before. My definition uh -huh. of leak would be to have something that should be sealed, that is not sealed and therefore loses something from inside. Because you can't, it, it's not only ink, ink, bleh, ink that leaks like this pen. Um, I had, Last summer I was in Calabria and my air mattress out on the water began mm -hmm. to leak air. So to lose, to not be something that should be sealed that has a hole or a tear and allows what should stay inside to go outside. Hey there, Roberta, welcome. Welcome from Salerno. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, so we can have you can have an air mattress that leaks air. You can have a pen that leaks ink. And also, for example, most common things are things which contain liquids. A lot of the time, it's more liquid than air because I suppose they're more noticeable. The air mattress is a great um, example. But things like you can have a leaky um, flask if you've got a cup which maybe seals with a lid and you turn it upside down and the water leaks out so you can have a leaky top to a, uh, a cup um you can have a leaking um bucket with a hole i've got a leaking bucket at the moment because it's cracked and so the water leaks out from the cracks that's a, so that's a leak for you and uh let's move on to the next slide and see what we've got in this one Okay, so we've got two different cases in this one. Now, this is a question for you guys who are listening, okay? So we'll read out the two different stories and what you need to chat, can you write down what you think the false friends are? So why is there a marketing blunder? And before we start, um, Terry, what's a marketing Blunder. What's another word for a blunder? If somebody is, uh, there's a marketing blunder, what is, what is it? Is it good? Is it bad? Is it positive? Is it negative? 
What's a marketing blend blunder? Definitely not a good thing. A blunder is a mistake. Exactly. A bad mistake, maybe, as well. Yeah, exactly. Oh, before we start this, we've got Vincenzo, who's come up with something. I was upset with a friend because he said to my wife that she was terrific. Aha, now, terrific. That's an interesting one. Terrific. Is terrific a positive word or a negative word in English? In English, it's it's incredibly positive. And in Italian? Any ideas? Now, I think I've made a similar mis a misunderstanding I had. I've never said it. But we have terrific and we have what we would normally talk about is terrible. Terrific and terrible. Now, terrific in English is really good if something is terrific. But if something is terrible, it's really bad. So if you say that your wife is terrific, it's a really good thing. If you say that your wife is terrible, then it's a really bad thing. So, uh, yes, there can be very, very big confusions with being either saying something is very good or very bad with terrific and terrible. So nice example there, Vincenzo. Okay. Did you, did, you, did you see Gianni's? Oh, did you see Gianni's Ooh. example? Oops. Ah, no, I didn't. Let's let's have a look at Gianni. So I remember when I used the word morbid with Italian translation, morbid or soft instead of obsessive. Hmm. Now that's an interesting one. Morbid, obsessive. That is right. Obsessive about what? Because morbid is an obsession is is obsessive, and generally we have. It's used in, con in, in conjunction with a particular type of thing that somebody can be uh, morbid about. If anybody has an idea, you can write that in the chat. Uh, let's go back to these, uh, let's go back to these <laughs> stories. And Are you okay there? <laughs> Are you just reading them? So, Terry, can you read the uh, first one? Lavinia's already maybe guessed it. But let's have a look. Let's read the stories first. Terry, can you read uh, the first one? Sorry, that's great. Okay. I made that mistake, which is why I started laughing. I've made that mistake. Frank's <laughs> homemade sausages. You will love our delicious sausages. We don't add any contraceptives. So not only are they delicious, but they are also healthy for you. <laughs> yeah. So Stephanie, Stephanie is just suggested, or Stefan, sorry, is just as uh, suggested additive. Mm, not additive as such. Um, what do we use when we talk about cookery? Do you know the term, uh, Terry? What would we say instead of not contraceptives? What would we use? Lavinia, Lavinia told us. She said we use preservatives instead of contraceptives. We have got the answer right there. And it can be confused with the preservativo, which means condom. Yes, exactly. Which I did. So what were you making? That you Did you put preservatives in something or did you, uh, no. did you leave the preservatives out? No, I was actually at the health food store and I was looking for something and I was asking for it without preservatives. <laughs> <laughs> I and, bet they had a full day without preservatives. <laughs> yeah, they, they thought I was a very strange person. Yeah. Oh, we have another one. Just Roberta talks about or rubbers in American English. Yeah, do you call them rubbers? Do you call them rubbers? Exactly. They're they're rubbers, which for yeah. me in British English, rubber being an eraser, the first yeah. time you hear someone, do you have a rubber? <laughs> I don't have a rubber. <laughs> Anyway, yeah, <laughs> hours of fun, yeah. But yeah, so we use yeah, condoms. Uh, we actually, it's quite interesting, my surname was uh, Johnson, and at school, I used to be called Johnny. And in English, we don't call them rubbers, we call them Johnnies. So condom, another word for condom is a Johnny. So I used to get called Johnny at school, yeah. Rubber Johnnies, which got shortened to uh, Johnny. So yeah, Johnny is another word for condom. And you don't put them in your food. So, yes, preservatives are what we use in our food. And that's a completely normal word. So what about in the second story? So everyone's done really well on the first one. So well done, guys, with that one. But let's have a look at the second uh, story. And Terry, can you read the second one? And in the chat, can you put down 
the situation, though I think somebody's already mentioned it once already. Uh, but have a look. Can you read for me, Terry? Home decor. This week only, our pillows are 50% off. The pillows are green, morbid, and medium-sized. Perfect for indoors or outdoors. Come see what we have in store. Okay. Lovely. So what is the problem with uh, this text? And um, before we start, uh, pillows. Now, I have another question, which perhaps some of you are uh, a little bit unsure about, but we'll see. What is the difference between, let me just put it up on the screen, pillows and cushions? Mm. So what is the difference between pillows and cushions? So that's another bonus question for you while uh, while you're wait we're waiting for the chat to come through. The chat sometimes has a little bit of delay, so you may have put your answer, but it takes us maybe 30 seconds to a minute to see them. So Stefan's come back with uh, an answer for this one, soft. The, the, um, yeah, the morbid is the false friend for the second story, exactly. So, and going back to morbid, why I said before about obsession, what's the, um, what's the, What's the thing about an obsession? Because obsession, is obsession always bad or can it be good, Terry? Obsession. Do you think it can be good or is it always bad? I think that colloquially we do use it in a good way. I'm obsessed with the series Breaking Bad, for example. Hmm. But usually we think of an obsession as something negative, something either dangerous or um, obsessed, something I can't stop thinking about. So I would say mm -hmm. that normally I would think of obsessed as bad, but I do think that we do colloquial use, colloquially use it in a positive sense. Hmm. Yeah, I'd agree with you. But it's interesting because um, I think it was Janie who said about the definition of morbid being obsessive. The thing about morbid, morbid is never good. So if you have a fascination with something, it's an unhealthy obsession, generally, because I think you could be obsessed with going to the gym. And, you know, it can be when you say it colloquially, that's not necessarily a negative thing. If you say you've got a morbid fascination with something, I would say it's always a negative meaning so that's just a little bit of a slight difference absolutely okay. oh interesting we've got fluffy instead of morbid yeah you could use fluffy yeah, yeah. Vir, vir, her name i think is vir, virginia virginia and ah, okay. that is see i think of fluffy like fluffy big puffy whereas i think soft I, would be soft Oh, I don't know, but if you watch the um, Despicable Me, if you've seen the if you've yeah. seen the TV uh, the film, and she talks about unicorns, and she goes, "It's so fluffy and fluffy." In that case, she does mean it's so soft. So yeah, if you does. look at Despicable Me, I think you know you can have it. So, okay, let's just see what Lavinia said about pillow. Uh, hmm, maybe pillow is just for the head bed, where you can find cushions, also on sofas or chairs. Yeah, good one. Exactly that. So basically a pillow is where you put your head for sleeping and a cushion is usually for decoration or on, as you say, the sofa or a chair. So good one there. OK, let's move on and have a look at the next part. So we have two more blunders to have a look at. So again, in the chat, can you write down what the false friends are and what you think it should be instead? And in the meantime, while you're doing that, I'll get Terry to read the situations. So Terry, can you read for me the first situation? Peter's fine shoe shop. Come into Peter's to find your next pair of shoes. Our shoes are highly our shoes are high quality leather, sleek and sensitive for all occasions. Okay, lovely. Before you go on, uh, just a quick question. Um, sleek, what is sleek? That's, an, that's a difficult word to describe. I'm glad I'm asking you that. Can you describe sleek for me? When I think of sleek, I think of something that is elegant with nice lines, um, something that is smooth, maybe a little bit shiny, 
but it, it's usually associated with elegant. I think of a sleek mm, yeah. car. Yeah, yeah, I was going to say that, a sleek car, a sleek looking uh, suit, for example, if there's been a suit that's been tailored that looks exactly right, and it is, it's elegant as well, I think. And we've got a, we've got another person who's come up with, yes, Lavinia again, well done, Lavinia. Sensible instead of sensitive, exactly right. So sensible, Terry, what would you use as a synonym for sensible or a description of sensible? Sensible. Sensible. Sensible in this case, usually when I think sensible, I think reasonable. But I think in this case, sensible for all occasions, um, something that is something that is correct. It's a good thing. It's um, usable, sensible for mm. all occasions. Sensible. Yeah, fit, fit for purpose as well. You could try oh, using yeah. fit for purpose. If something is sensible, it means it's the right thing to wear. So a lot of people, a lot of women wear... Um, shoes with very high heels and uh they're really uncomfortable and those shoes in my books are not sensible shoes but they don't sensible shoes are generally comfortable but they don't look very nice you know, <laughs> generally i think <laughs> okay so we've got the sensible instead of sensitive uh let's read the one on the right can you read about the venus vacuums our vacuums are specially designed to suck more dirt out of your carpets, ensuring a good, polite every time. Hmm. Okay, so what's the false friend in this one? And I have a question for you. I don't know whether it's the same in the US. Do you have a different name for vacuum? Do you call vacuums different things? Or are they all called vacuums? Well, it depends because oftentimes people will, will refer to vacuums by a couple of different brand names. So there's like the, the Dirt Devil, which is a little handheld portable. So if anyone has a little handheld portable that's not necessarily the same make or model, they'll still call it the Dirt Devil. Or mm, the most okay. famous vacuum brand is called Hoover. If you have a Hoover vacuum, you might say Hoover, but only if you have a, that particular brand. And in, and in the UK? In the UK, we use Hoover. And there's a verb to Hoover. So literally, you Serious. Hoover. Yep. And so vacuum, to vacuum something, you won't hear it in the UK. You'll hear literally, oh, I need to Hoover the house. Really? I need to vacuum. We would use I need to hoover. I hoovered yesterday. And and just like we've got Swiffer, I Swiffered. So that's becoming a verb now as well. But we definitely hoover. And you can <laughs> hoover with any types of things. You can hoover with a Dyson. Um, because you don't say Dyson. I Dysoned my room. We don't no. say. But we still use the verb to hoover. Definitely. Um, so, yeah, it's hoover. Right. Yeah, it's to do the hoovering as... Yeah, as uh, Roberta says, you must have had some English education there, Roberta, because Terry's looking uh, very perplexed at my use of Hoover. But yeah, to do the Hoovering, that's what I do. I don't like doing it, but I do it. And we've got a couple of guesses. So Vincenzo has come up with uh, a good clean, not polite. Excellent. Uh, Jani as well, polite instead of clean. Interesting, Roberta's put polish instead of polite. Mm. You could enjoy a good polish, Mm. What's the difference between polish and clean, Terry? What's mm. the difference between polish and clean? In the case of this vacuuming, would you say that you polish with a vacuum mm, you or would you clean with a vacuum? You can't polish with a vacuum because to polish is um, you polish the silver. You polish, you can polish wood. It's to clean something to a shine. If you polish something, you polish shoes but you can't clean your carpet to a shine. Yeah, exactly, yeah, exactly. So uh, it's definitely not polite, which is a different meaning, but we have polish and clean, two different ones. Vacuuming, unless you've got a particular sponge on your vacuum that creates this shine after you finish, then you would be cleaning your carpet, not polishing it. You polish your floors. 
for example, if you have a particular machine that polishes your floors, for example. Um, right. But those would be floors with tiles or with uh, with wood, as Terry said. Great. Um, you can buffer your floors, buff them. Yeah. Yeah, you can as well. Yeah. Good. Ah, oh, we have here polished like lucid. Mm. Mm, another false friend. Yeah, lucid. Lucid. Can you, what's the difference between lucid and polished? That's an interesting one. Can you help there, Terry? Oh, goodness. You're making me really work today. Um, <laughs> now, but lucid, lucid is a state of mind. Lucid, mm. is, lucid is to be aware. Um, lucid is to be in your right mind where, uh, so polish, to polish something, it becomes shiny, it becomes bright. It might become even reflective because it's so bright, but mm. lucid, definitely a state of mind. Is there another? Yeah. And I would say it's clear rather than shiny. Yeah. But I would say lucid you used to describe people and their minds, not necessarily objects. But uh, but yeah, good one. OK, so uh, we've got uh, next slide. Some of you moved on already, but let's have a look. Can you just uh, have a look here, Terry? We're going to read through the sentences. And as you guys are doing, you need to work out which of the pairs you need to decide on. We'll read them through and then we'll look at the uh, right answers. So can you read the first one for me, Terry? Sure. I can't watch movies about the war. I'm too blank and I cry too much. Mm, number two. The park is littered with garbage. Someone should really mm, it up. Mm. The mm, firefighter rescued the child. It is mm, to cover your mouth when you sneeze. The film was so, he nearly fell asleep. And my family has a, where they grow vegetables. Okay, so most of you have been writing your answers and putting it in the chat. We're gonna go through them. And in the meantime, if you've put the answers in, what does the other word mean? So for example, in the first one we have sensitive and sensible. If you know which one is the right one, then what is the definition for the other one? We've seen some of them already, so the first one we'll look at together. But for the other ones, if you have, uh, if you've chosen one of them, can you write in the chat, what's the definition for the other word that you haven't used, okay? So uh, the first one, uh, let's have a look together. We've got some answers here. Uh, we've got here, I think, uh, let's try, with, we've got Roberta here with sensitive. Okay, can you just read it with the correct one for me, Terry, for number one? I can't watch movies about the war. I'm too sensitive and I cry too much. Mm, are you sensitive when you watch films? Depends on the film. It really depends on the film. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I find that um, I, I use sensitive and I also use the word emotional. I get, I get emotional rather than sensitive. Sensitive for me is maybe when you, uh, when you react, overreact to something which maybe you shouldn't react to. But emotional is more when you cry the whole time. And I find I get emotional about films because I cry a lot for no reason. I just <laughs> cry and I'm fine. <laughs> but, so give you guys who've got that one right. Uh, nice to, a definition of sensible from Jani here. Sensible, reasonable. Yeah, good one. Exactly. Sensible, reasonable again from Roberta. Very good. Okay. Number two. Uh, before we start this, the park is littered with garbage. Now, garbage is an American word. What do we say in English, Terry? Do you know? Rubbish. Yes, exactly. So the park is littered with rubbish. You're doing well on these English questions. I'm glad you're not <laughs> asking me the American ones. I'm rubbish with American words. Uh, someone should really... And then what do we have here? Well, I think that Roberta gave it to us when she said... Yeah. Ah, yes, we've got it here. Clean it up. 
Perfect. Very good. And polite, the definition of polite. So what's the definition of polite? We've got here from Lavinia, actually. Good one. Polite with good manners. Yeah, very good. Lovely. Okay. Uh, number three, Terry, what's number three? Hmm, the mm, firefighter. Well, honestly, when I read this, I thought, and I agree with Lavinia, that I think in the third, both are correct. But I think he was a good firefighter. Yeah, I, you'd like to think that all firefighters are good because if you had a bad firefighter, well, that's true. Then, I don't know. I look at it from the point of view of could you have the negative? And for that point, the good firefighter as opposed to the rubbish one or the bad one that stood in the corner and didn't do anything. So you're True. right. They both could fit. But I feel that in this case, brave is the uh, is is the better answer, because otherwise you're inferring that there's a there's a rubbish firefighter who can't do his job as opposed to uh, what's the opposite of brave? Does anyone know what the opposite of brave is? Drop it in the chat if you know the opposite of brave. Not you, Terry. I just hope <laughs> you know that one. But there's somebody listening. Ah, we've got uh, we've got the a synonym for it. Brave equals courageous. But what is the opposite of brave? So if you've got a firefighter who's not brave, what are they? So drop it in the chat if you know. Uh, number four, Terry. Can you have a look at number four? It is polite to cover your mouth when you sneeze. Yeah, so so a few of you got this one right. Uh, so what's the difference between polite and educated? I've not seen anybody coming up with uh, a definition for the polite um, or educated. Polite we've got with good manners. Educated, What is what are you if you are educated? So have a look. If somebody can drop in the chat what they think um, a definition of educated is and we have here roberta coming up with now coward is is the person but what is the adjective so you can have a brave person and brave is the is the adjective a coward is uh, is the opposite of a brave person but what is the adjective so coward is the noun what is the adjective that's interesting, isn't it, Jay, uh, isn't it, Sarah, that we have that we have this adjective and this noun, coward and the adjective, but we don't have that for brave. Yeah, there's not a there's not a a, a name for a, a brave per well, it's a brave person. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, we've got uh, back to the uh, definitions here. We've got. Um, Educated, meaning literate, and educated, it's in relation with the school. Yeah, exactly that. So generally, it's related to instruction that you receive as a child, usually from either the school or it could be from your parents, but it's the instruction process of learning information to be educated. So you can be home educated. At the moment, everyone's being online educated <laughs> as opposed to going to school. But um, yeah, so you've got educated being literally related to instruction pertaining to, the, to learning information as opposed to the polite, which is about manners and your behavior. So it's uh, different there. Ah, Vincenzo has got the, uh, ad the adjective cowardly. Yeah, very good. If somebody is cowardly, Perfect. And we've got another synonym for brave, meaning bold. Yeah, very good. Brave and bold. But there's still no person. There's no there's no noun for a person who's brave. I can't think of one. So let's move on. Number five. Oh, sorry. Hero. A hero. We often refer to firefighters yes, as heroes. But that gives the a hero. You can be a hero without being brave, can't you? I suppose that the whole thing thing with somebody just because they've yeah. done something they it's it, it, you don't necessarily have to be brave to be a hero no i think just trying to find an trying to find an opposite for coward somebody who isn't brave yeah <laughs> or the opposite of somebody who's brave it is there's not i don't i can't think of one 
Anyway, number five, let's move on. <laughs> the film was so boring, he nearly fell asleep. Yeah, good. And we've had a definition from Roberta for annoying. Nice one here, annoying. To be annoying, fed up. Interesting, fed up and annoying. How they're similar, but they're not exactly the same. So, Terry, can you talk us through what's the difference between annoying and fed up? Well, I think if something is annoying, it can be something very small. For example, um, I'm eating and the fly is, and I'm constantly like, the, it's annoying. Now, if it's annoying for a period of time, I'm annoyed, I'm more annoyed, and I arrive at fed up. Exactly. And fed up is the description of your feeling. And so how do you feel? I feel fed up. Why are you fed up? Because the film is annoying, for example. So if the film annoys you, it can make you fed up. But the film itself can't be fed up because that relates to a feeling for a person and, and a film wouldn't have feelings. OK, so you can be fed up because the film is annoying, but the film can't be fed up. OK, so it would be annoyed is like fed up, but annoying is a description. Therefore, you couldn't use it. To, you couldn't use fed up to describe the film. But good. OK, and let's look at the last one. Somebody I think has already got this one right as well. Terry, can you just read it for me? My family has a farm where they grow vegetables. Yeah, exactly. So well done, Roberta, there for that one. And we had a nice definition of factory. So the factory from Jani, exactly that. Factory is related to industry. It is related to industry, but factory, what exactly is a factory? Terry, can you help uh, Jani out to describe the difference between industry and factory? Well, a factory is the actual place where something is made. Car factory, um, apparel factory, shoe factory. So it's a place where something is made or constructed. And industry? Um, industry, we refer to, we refer to industry. Hmm. So the car industry includes makers like Fiat, um, General Motors, um, mm. any Chevrolet. These are all different car makers and they all together are part of the car industry. Yeah, you could almost substitute it with sector, but it mm. has to be related to production. So you couldn't have the, well, you could actually have the teaching industry the teaching oh. sector. <clears throat> so maybe it's uh, it's similar to that, but it's usually related to a profession, a group of things that, that produce something. So in teaching, we produce lessons, I suppose, which is why you talk about the teaching industry, the education industry, the medical industry. Um, so yeah, it's kind of similar to sector. Okay. And a uh, nice one from Jani, just going back a second to annoying. Yeah, annoying, irritating. Exactly. That would be uh, that would be a good synonym as well. Very good. OK, so we have uh, let's move on and just have a look at the. Oh, the. Uh, next slide, I'm actually we're going to um, come away from that because they're not actually on the slides, but I have uh, something that we'll do which is where I'm going to describe to you, Terry, uh, a particular noun, and you have to tell me what the word is. And then if you're listening, guys, what you need to do is come up with what you think the false friend is, okay? So um, I'll do the first two and you'll get the idea. Um, so, Terry, what is the name of the place where you buy books? Oh, I almost said that one. Wait a minute. Bookstore, bookshop. Okay, bookstore or bookshop. Uh, shop. Okay, good. What is the name of the place where you, or let's ask a different way. What do you do at the library? Well, at the library, I borrow books. 
Okay, good. So you've got the typical false friends of library and bookshop. Exactly. So, Stefan, as you said that, or um, Virginia, isn't it? Sorry, I keep calling you Stefan Bayer. But the um, you've got the library and the bookshop. Okay. Now, I'm going to ask you another question. And this time, you can all just put in the chat what you think my definitions are okay so um this is the place where you keep your car so that in the winter it doesn't get wet so it's an internal storage room but for your car so what's the name of the internal storage room where you keep your car okay that's the first one Ah, Stefan is my husband. That explains everything. <laughs> Thank you for clarifying. <laughs> okay, so um, what's the name of the place where you keep your car, especially in winter, uh, and it's, uh, it's a room where you put your car? Okay, so that's the first. Ah, parking lot. Now, hmm, parking lot is generally not covered i wouldn't have said i don't know what's your, what's your definition of parking lot terry would you can for me a parking lot wouldn't be covered no for me a parking lot is outside in front of a store or a building yeah so that would be for us that would be a car park so in the uk we would say uh, a car park we don't use parking lots in the uh uk ah we don't have car parks ah. Oh, well, there you go. So no, in uh, in the UK we talk about car parks. You put it in the car park, and you guys talk about parking lot. So yeah, uh, Vincenzo's got it right. It's called the garage. Okay, exactly. And uh, what is the thing called that you use if you're moving house and you want to put all your things inside something that's made of uh, very rigid paper? Well, it's like a, a, a paper product and you use it in order to put your things inside so that when it goes and you move, they fit nice together because they're usually rectangular or square in shape. They come in different sizes and they have a particular word that is sometimes confused with the garage in Italian. Any idea what that word could be? And Vincenzo's on the mark again with box. So, yeah, so the box is the thing you use to put your things in and the garage is what you use to put your car in. OK, and we're just do one more and otherwise we're going to run out of time. So in the chat, can you tell us what is the difference between? Can you read the words for me, Terry? <laughs> Warehouse and magazine. Hmm. OK, so let's have a look if you can come up with the difference between the two words with warehouse and magazine. Sarah, Amy, you got any ideas? Yeah, I'm confused. Why would garage and box be confusing? How is that a false? Friend? Ah. Ah, I don't know, because in, in Italian, people talk, people put their cars in boxes. You're not heard. There's the word in box. If you want to rent a box in Italian, the box is uh, is uh, is what we would call a garage. Oh. So they use. So if you ever hear people <laughs> talking about parking their cars in boxes, um, you know that they're not parking in boxes. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Lavinia. Yeah. I had yeah. no idea. Yeah. 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 So yeah, that's uh, that's the reason why. Yeah. Okay, so the difference between warehouse and magazine, we have very good, Jani. You read a magazine and you work in a warehouse. Perfect. Excellent. Okay, guys, well, that's it for today. We hope you have fun learning all about it's been our pleasure, as always, to uh, have you with us. And thank you so much for putting all your comments and contributing to the uh, the, the webinars. May it's so much more fun when you guys really participate. We hope you found it useful. We hope that you've enjoyed it and we hope you've learned something as well. And so until the next time, thank you very much and we'll see you all again soon.